In this module, we are going to talk about why the futures price can be different from the expected future spot price and how we can use the capital asset pricing model to explain some of these differences. So remember, in the previous section, we discussed that there are some instances where you would have a current future price of a particular asset and that current future price could be different from the expected future spot price. So we, we discussed, for example, let's assume uh, asset is trading at $100 today and the six month future price of that particular asset is $120. So the, in the futures market, a uh, six month future on the same asset is trading at $120. So th what, what that means is as part of the futures contract, you can en have a position on that asset in six months time at $120. But let's assume the expected future spot price. So this is kind of the average expectation, what, what the market thinks the asset is going to be in six months time is $110. In, in other words, it's different from the futures price. Sometimes it can be less like here, it's $110 and sometimes it can be more like here, which is $130. So here in this section, we are going to link the capital asset pricing model to explain why this could be the case sometimes. So remember in the capital asset pricing model, basically we have the expected return in a particular portfolio is linked to the risk-free rate plus beta times the excess return in the market over the risk-free rate. So remember beta tells us how sensitive a portfolio is compared to the market as a whole. So that's what beta tells us and th that's the return in the market and that's the risk-free rate. So this you could call it as the excess return in the market over the risk-free rate. So this is the capital asset pricing model. Now here what we are saying is, so if you have a portfolio A or let's assume you hold a particular asset, let's assume the this is a particular US stock. Now if this portfolio is positively correlated with the S&P 500. Now in, in this example, let's assume that the S&P 500 is a, is a reflection of the whole market. So if this portfolio is positively correlated with S&P 500, what that means is that if the market moves upward, the portfolio also will move upwards. And if the market drops, the portfolio also would drop. In other words, since it's positively correlated, which means the beta is a positive number. So if you think about if the beta is a positive number, this, this whole thing will be greater than zero, which means the expected return on the portfolio will be definitely greater than the risk-free rate. So if we say that the expected return uh, on the portfolio is X, basically what we are saying is if the portfolio is positively correlated with the S&P 500 or with the market as a whole, the return on the portfolio, which is X, will be greater than the risk-free rate, which does make sense. You know, for example, if you're holding a particular portfolio and you're expecting the volatility of that portfolio is to be positively correlated with the market, that means your, your, your beta is positive, which means your expected return on the portfolio will be greater than the risk-free rate. Now, let's look at the third case. If your portfolio is negatively correlated with the with S&P 500 or with the market, that means if the market moves up, your portfolio will move down and vice versa. So which means your beta is negative. Remember, beta tells you how sensitive is your the port is your portfolio compared to the market. So if it's negatively correlated, beta will be a negative number. So if this is a negative number, that means when you add these two together, what you will get will be less than the risk-free rate. Will be less than the risk-free rate because this is a, this will be a negative number. 
So your expected return of your portfolio will be less than the risk-free rate if you are negatively correlated. And of course, if you are not correlated with the S&P 500 or with the market, then your beta is zero. So in that case, your expected return will be simply the risk-free rate. So now we are going to discuss this same thing what we discussed here, but with some details in terms of a formula for you to how you can link the futures price with the expected future spot price, how these two can vary based on the expected return of the portfolio and the risk-free rate. So let's assume you have a particular portfolio and the portfolio's value today is P. And let's assume the future price of that portfolio in time T is F. Now if R is your risk-free rate, let's assume the R is compounded on an annual basis, then you could say that if you discount your future price based on R, you will arrive at P. So this is a formula, it's a very simple formula, you're saying this is your future price over time T. If you discount it based on your risk-free interest rate with annual compounding R, you will come back to P. So that's, that's the formula here. Now let's see how you can create a synthetic position in the asset at time t. So remember, when we talk about a synthetic position, basically what we are saying is how you can create a similar position in a particular trade, but without actually holding that trade. So when we are talking about holding a synthetic position in the asset at time t, now of course the most easiest way is you just purchase that asset at time t and then you will hold the asset. But when we are saying synthetic position in the asset at time t, basically what we are saying is we want to use some other trades and come up with a risk profile that will look exactly as if we are holding the asset in time t. So that can be done by entering into these two trades. So the first one is you invest P at the risk-free rate R. So in other words, you invest a cash amount equivalent to P at the risk-free rate R. So that will be negative P. Remember, because you're investing means the cash goes out of you. So that's minus P. So remember, over T, over a time period of T, that P will grow to P times 1 plus R over the time period T. So that investment P will grow to P multiplied by 1 plus R over the time period of T. And we are assuming R is the risk-free rate based on annual compounding. So that's your first trade. You invest P at the risk-free rate. And then you enter into a long futures contract to purchase the asset at time t. So remember, the second trade, when you enter into a long futures contract, there's no cash inflows or outflows. When you enter into a futures contract, you do not actually pay or receive cash. But when you enter into a long futures contract, at maturity, at time t, part of your futures contract, you will purchase the asset part of the future and you will pay f. So that's what you, you, you see here minus F because you will have to pay this money. That's minus F. Now when you invest P at your risk-free rate, that will grow to this amount F here. So that means A and B will cancel out. Now when you purchase the asset as part of the futures contract, you will pay F and you will hold the asset. So A and B, if you enter into trades A and B and you hold them till time T, you will result, the resulting position will be C, which is you will have an asset in the market and let's, let's assume that the value of the asset at time T is ST. And now here I'm saying sell the asset because if you sell it, you will have the cash equivalent to ST. You don't have to sell it. You, even if you hold the asset, basically you will end up with this position. You will end up with ST. So that's that's how we have created a synthetic position. So we have created a synthetic position in the asset at time t. You can see we did not buy the asset directly. We entered into these two trades. We invested P 
at the risk free rate and we entered into a long futures contract by doing entering taking positions in these two trades we end up with c in other words we end up with a position in the asset at time t so based on this so this is the same thing so if you see in summary we invested p in time zero so we invested p and at time t we end up with st so that's the summary of the position we invested p remember when you're entering into a futures contract you do not pay or receive any money so this will not involve any cash flows so we invested p and we ended up with st so let's so this 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 whole thing is a it's a combination of uh, two trades so you can consider this as a particular portfolio so you can say the expected return from this asset st equals p remember this is what we invested the cash we invested is p p multiplied by 1 plus x now let's assume x is the return the total return from this investment in other words if you take a and b together as a portfolio the return from this portfolio is x so what we are saying is we invest p and then that investment grows at a rate of x so that's what we are multiplying 1 plus x over a time period of t and that will give us the this will give us st which is the expected future spot price at time t so this formula basically tells us i'll take p i'll invest p over a t time period so that's this and if the expected return from the synthetic produced position that's x x is the expected return from the synthetically produced position it will grow at a rate of x and that will give me st which is the spot price of the asset at time t so that's the future spot price now here we can replace p using this formula remember we said if you discount f at the risk free rate you will get p so instead of p here we can put f over 1 plus r over a time period of t so that's what we have done here we have replaced p with f over 1 plus r to the power of t so here you can see that the relationship between the future spot price at time t remember this is the future spot price at time t this is the expectation operator so the future spot price at time t compared to the futures price which is f is dependent on two things x and r and remember x we said is the expected return from the synthetically produced position in other words in a nutshell you can say x is the expected return of the asset as a whole so the relationship between the future spot price and the futures price is dependent on two things the expected return of the asset and the risk free rate so we can make these conclusions now if your expected return of the asset is greater than the risk free rate in other words you are expecting you, you hold an asset and you are expecting this asset to grow much higher than the risk free rate then what you could say is that the expected future spot price will be more than the futures price i mean you can here and here plug in some numbers if your x is greater than r you can put two here and one here and you will get this arrive at this so if your expected return from your asset is greater than the risk free rate then your expected future spot price will be more than the futures price now what that means is the correlation between your underlying asset and the market is greater than zero if you think about it if you're expecting your assets return to be much more than the risk free rate then what you're saying is that the correlation between the asset and the market is greater than zero which means the systematic risk of that particular asset is greater than zero remember the systematic risk means the how sensitive is your asset to the market as a whole so that's what the systematic risk 
tells you. So if your systematic risk is positive, that means if the market moves positive, if the market has a positive move, your asset will also have a positive move. Now, if your X is less than R, in other words, the expected return of your asset is less than the risk-free rate, then your future spot price will be less than the futures price because basically you are expecting your asset to have a lower return than the risk-free rate. Now this is the case when the correlation between your asset and the market is less than zero which means the asset moves in the opposite direction of the market. That same as the when we say the systematic risk is less than zero. In, in other words, it's a, it's a negative number. In other words, it moves in the opposite direction of the market. Now, an example of this is gold. I'll, I'll come back to this. Now, if your X equals R, that means the expected return of your asset equals the risk-free rate, then simply what you're saying is my expected future spot price will be same as the futures price. In other words, there's no correlation between the asset and the market. So that means there's no systematic risk. Now, to conclude this, if you think about it, most of the commodities or also most of the financial assets, they do well when the market is doing well. You know, for example, if the market's going through a boom, then most of the stock prices will reflect that and also the commodities. That means they'll always follow the market. So most of the financial assets and commodities will come in this first category where they are positively correlated with the market. So if the market does well, they will do well. And if the market drops, the prices of those assets and commodities also will drop. Now, the one of the examples for the second one, where the correlation between the asset and the market is negative, in other words, it moves in the opposite direction of the market, is gold. Because if you think about it, now even in these times when, you know, due to the pandemic when the market's not doing that well what most investors will do is they will put their money in gold as a safe bet so in other words so there'll be more demand for gold when the market's not doing that well which means the price of the gold will go up when the market price goes down so gold is an example where the expected future price will be less than what the what's indicated by the futures price because gold is normally considered to be negatively correlated with the market. And then of course, if there's no correlation, then the expected future spot price equals the futures price. Now, having said all this, one thing to remember is that, is it possible to empirically prove these three? In other words, can you empirically prove that the expected future spot price is different from the futures price. Now, the conclusion is that the best estimate of the expected future spot price is the futures price. So that's something to remember. The best estimate of the expected future spot price is the futures price. Now, of course, we can use this uh, capital asset pricing model to explain any differences we see when the expected future spot price is not same as the futures price, but the best estimation of the expected future spot price is the futures price. So that's something to remember. If you have any questions, uh, put it as a comment or drop us an email and uh, we can have a look. Thank you.